The SR-72 Son of the Blackbird may be the most capable concept aircraft ever created. And is it just a concept? Save the end of this video and I'll give you my thoughts as a former fighter pilot as to what this jet will actually look like, whether it's already in existence today, what it may or may not carry, how many pilots may or may not be in this thing, and ultimately how will this be used from a strategic defense perspective and offensive perspective. Let's dive in to the SR-72 Son of Blackbird. So we can't talk about the son without talking about the dad. And in this case, the dad is the Blackbird, the SR-71, the fastest manned aircraft ever created, the fastest aircraft period that's known to date. How fast could the SR-71 go? It could literally go from Washington DC to Los Angeles in under an hour. And that's 2,193 miles per hour in recorded flight and possibly going even faster in classified flight. How high could it go? 85,000 to 90,000 feet. We're talking way up in the Earth's atmosphere. And again, those are just unclassified numbers. What was the mission of the SR-71? And could that be similar to the mission of the SR-72? Well, the mission of the SR-71 was essentially to give the ultimate middle finger to the USSR or any other nation that was competing with the United States. It was able to turn and outrun any missile that was fired at it. And documents have revealed that over 800 missiles were fired at the SR-71 from its time of its first mission all the way until its retirement in 1999. Having outrun every single missile, we've definitely got the king. The mountain has been conquered by the SR-71. So could anything actually compete with that? And not to mention the fact that the SR-71 had such a capability as a strategic reconnaissance aircraft that it could record video and high resolution imagery of an entire country in some would say two to three hours. Entire swaths of the Earth's surface could be recorded and then given back to higher headquarters to show strategic reconnaissance operations and show what was actually going on on the ground in hot wars that were taking place all across the earth. And in a matter of mere minutes, the SR-71 could accomplish its mission and transmit those photos back to higher headquarters. So what could the SR-72 actually do that would be better than the SR-71? Why don't we just have the SR-71 still in existence today? Well, on a personal note, as a fighter pilot, knowing the limitations of the SR-71 is something that I want you to keep in mind as we look towards the future and the development of the SR-72. The SR-71 had fuel tanks that would leak, and then once they got up to hypersonic speeds, the fuel tanks would actually seal themselves due to the pressure and the heat but on the ground these fuel tanks would leak jet fuel and it was specially designed jet fuel that could only be used in the SR-71. So not to mention the fact that it's actually leaking this stuff but it's so expensive to leak that out on the ground prior to takeoff. The SR-71 had approximately seven minutes from the time it started up to taxi up to the runway and take off and then from that point it had around seven more minutes to get onto a tanker before it would fully exhaust itself of fuel and the pilot would have to crash land or eject from the aircraft. Now that is a limitation that you do not want to build into any follow-on aircraft due to the fact that the most taxing part of the mission takes place right at the very beginning during takeoff getting to the tanker, I'm talking about the pressure that's put on that pilot is distracting because then you're putting that pilot in a position where they're using their adrenaline, they're using all their useful consciousness to just get the thing airborne and fully fueled with gas. And then from there, they have to actually go up, outrun missiles, take pictures of other nations in high context scenarios where they might have to really think in the gray area to actually make the mission accomplished. But now you're taxing that pilot to the limits, and not to mention coming back to land at extremely high speeds. The SR-71 just had so many limitations when it came to the actual operation of the aircraft that it detracted from the mission. 
Ideally, you want a fighter jet to be extremely user-friendly. That's why a lot of the fighter jets that I flew, you got in and the engineers knew that this was a single pilot cockpit or maybe two, a pilot and a wizzo. So most things had to be automated. You didn't want to overtax the fighter pilot with actually just flying the aircraft because as a fighter pilot, you're going to be operating radars. You're going to be operating pods like the sniper pod that's looking out and getting imagery as you fly over target areas. So you want to really have the aircraft flying be second nature and be relatively simple now don't get me wrong there's going to be challenging parts of flying any aircraft no matter what it is but at the end of the day dog fighting should be one of those things that's challenging but actually just taking off getting to a tanker and then landing that should really be second nature for the aircraft and the aircraft should work with you which leads me to the sr-72 and one of the biggest adaptations that we're going to see in the sr-72 whether it's flying right now or not and we'll get to that here in a second is the fact that the sr-72 will be designed to take off at a much slower airspeed and land at a much slower airspeed than the sr-71 this is just going to create a situation where the sr-72 is user friendly for the pilot. Lockheed Martin is said to be developing the SR-72 as we speak. And again, it could already be in existence just in a highly classified black program. But what would be the requirements for the SR-72? Well, the first thing would be for the SR-72 to go twice the speed of the SR-71. Otherwise, it's just kind of not really worth it. So Mach 6 is going to be the minimum speed that we're going to see in the SR-72. And again, like I talked about before, it's got to be safer for takeoff and landing and the margins of getting this thing up to a tanker cannot be as slim. It's got to be much more user friendly for the pilot to open up that pilot's mission capability and situational awareness once they actually get into the mission itself. And it's definitely going to have better technology. It's most likely going to integrate some of the technology from the F-35, the F-22 and build upon that to have an even more capable strategic reconnaissance ability. And then most likely the SR-72 is going to be capable of precision strikes. It's going to be able to release weapons and it could actually just be a stand-in bomber, meaning it's going so fast that it doesn't need to release hypersonic weapons because it's going hypersonic speeds itself. And a stand-in bomber is a bomber that's either stealth or going so fast that it can't be targeted by the enemy. So it can literally be right over the battlefield and drop its weapons. Some have also said that it might be a standoff bomber, which which means it's going to release its weapons from far away and release hypersonic weapons. And that could be a formidable use of the SR-72 as well. I mean, imagine the SR-72 going Mach 6 and then releasing a hypersonic weapon going Mach 6. It's like giving a high speed push to your best friend and making them twice as good. But Robert Weiss, the CEO of Lockheed Martin in 2013, released the fact that the SR-72 was under development to Aviation Week. Whether he meant to release this or not is up for debate. He may have released it due to try to get more funding from the Pentagon and from Skunk Works and other black ops programs, or he might have just leaked it because he was so excited because literally this project would be one of the coolest aircraft ever built in aviation history. And at the time, it was reported that Lockheed and the firm Aerojet Rocketdyne, they made a breakthrough development by combining two different types of engines. It was called a cycle engine, and it involved both a turbine for speeds below Mach 3 and a scramjet engaged for hypersonic cruising. Now, most scramjets operate at about Mach 4, so you've got a bit of a gap between Mach 2 to 3 all the way to Mach 4. So what would actually power the aircraft in between that? That would take an adaptation and an evolution of technology as well. But the fact that they're creating this cycle engine that has basically that traditional jet engine that can get up to speeds of about Mach 2.2, that's about the fastest you would see in like an F-15C, an F-22 aircraft like that. And that is kind of going downhill. On a personal note, when I got the F-15E up to about Mach 1.3, it was it was like I was on a fancy roller coaster because I went up to about 50,000 feet, plugged the thing into max afterburner, essentially used every drop of fuel that I could and still have enough left to land. And I got that thing up to close to Mach 
Mach 1.3. But think about the SR72. It's going to have to get past that by a whole nother Mach, so Mach 2.2, and then get to a space where it can bridge that gap until it can engage its scramjet engine and hit Mach 4 plus. Let's talk a little bit more about the scramjet engine. A scramjet generates thrust by sucking in air while traveling at supersonic speeds, meaning that a separate engine has to push the airplane to those speeds before the scramjet can engage like we talked about before. And then the combined cycle engine makes the dual engine approach viable by having the turbofan and the scramjet engine use the exact same intakes on the front of the SR-72 and the exact same nozzles on the back of the SR-72. It just would not be aerodynamically feasible to try to have two intakes for one engine, two intakes for the other engine, and then two outlets for both of those. You've got to utilize the same intakes and technology at the time back in the 2010s may not have been able to account for that but now there's definitely proof that technology can make this happen with the adaptations of 3d printing and we're going to get into that here in a second but during that interview weiss made it clear that he was very optimistic that lockheed martin was going to receive funding of over a billion dollars to develop a single engine prototype and then once that single engine prototype worked he was very optimistic that Lockheed Martin would then get funding for a dual engine variant of the SR-72, which would then become the production model, and most likely the U.S. would purchase over 100 SR-72s. But why is the SR-72 so secretive? Why is everyone so tight-lipped besides Weiss? Well, I believe that's because the fact that the SR-72 would not just be strategic reconnaissance. Creating something that could go this fast and investing this much money into it, the requirement would definitely be, in my humble opinion, that it carry weapons, hypersonic weapons, nuclear weapons, conventional weapons, and basically create a hypersonic bomber for the U.S. inventory. And that's an adaptation on the SR-71 because with the SR-71, you basically had the vanilla model that could just strategic reconnaissance so if you want the neapolitan model you want the strawberries you want the chocolate and the vanilla you want the bomber and the strategic bomber that can go in and tag targets before they even have time to react so do you want speed or do you want stealth high level executives at lockheed martin have been quoted as saying speed is the new stealth and this is where i tend to disagree slightly with those calculations and here's why I believe the SR-72 would lack stealth characteristics that can be found in the F-35, the F-22, and in the RQ-180 stealth drone. The reason why is because it's going so fast and creating so much heat that that's going to show up in a much more clear way than an aircraft going at slower speeds. That heat is going to be easily detectable by infrared sensors. And I believe the SR-72's existence, potentially already flying, might be the reason why there's a hypersonic missile arms race. So missiles are just going to get faster in order to compete with the SR-72. So in my opinion, it might be way more advantageous to focus on stealth rather than speed. And if you can find somewhere that threads the needle and hits the sweet spot where it's just fast enough, but not fast enough to trigger the enemy's infrared sensors, then maybe you've found the sweet spot in fighter and bomb aviation. The SR-71 Blackbird was retired in 1999, but there was no clear replacement in line to take its spot. Why was that? Well, my opinion, again, is that spy satellites had advanced so much that the capability of those satellites was surpassing the SR-71. Additionally, an emphasis from the Pentagon on unmanned aerial vehicles that could become stealth or their focus on the F-22, which was already under development at the time, and the F-30 was basically a concept aircraft the emphasis on those became more important than the speed of the sr-71 because i believe they realized what i talked about a second ago the fact that stealth was the new stealth speed wasn't the new stealth and again would the sr-72 even have pilots my opinion again is there would be a version that would have pilots and then there would be a version that doesn't and when you look at the concept that was leaked in 2018 by lockheed martin as well we can really see the fact that this thing doesn't have pilots but my opinion is that they would have pilots in some of them and the reason why is nuclear weapons the u.s in my opinion is never going to send up an aircraft or a drone at least for decades that doesn't at least have a person in the chain of operations of releasing that nuclear weapon it's just too much of a liability having a nuclear weapon up in an unmanned aerial vehicle that could be hijacked 
by hackers and can be taken over by nefarious forces. You're always going to want a person in that chain, at least for now, which is why I think there would be manned and unmanned versions of the SR-72, with the manned versions being focused on nuclear weapons and the unmanned versions being really highly focused in on stand-in or stand-off bombing and then also strategic reconnaissance. So how would it be developed? Well, it would be developed in Skunk Works. And my opinion is that it's already developed. Whether it's flying right now, I think it definitely could be, but there's probably a model they can pull off the shelf, click their fingers a couple times, get an assembly line set up, and this bad boy would be off to the races. And the reason I think that is because of Jack O'Banion from Lockheed Martin and what he leaked in 2018 about that graphic that I just talked about. Jack O'Banion says without digital transformation, that aircraft you see there could not have been made. Five years ago, it could not have been made. And Jack went on to say that Lockheed Martin continues to test and adapt its engines, which would be the most complicated part of this. Having that cycle engine that could do both turbo and scramjet operations. Back in the day, this wasn't possible, but now in 20 2018 and what Jack's hinting at is the fact that 3D modeling has created an opportunity for Lockheed Martin to develop an engine that could essentially cool itself with way less or basically he says zero moving parts and my assumption is that those zero moving parts would be in the scramjet with the traditional jet engine again getting it up to Mach 2.2. And Jack goes on to say that the reusable hypersonic system, RHS, is a far-term solution that will be made possible by the pathfinding work that Lockheed Martin is doing today. So essentially he's saying, hey, we've got the SR-72. Uh, that must be a cool feeling. <laughs> but the purpose of O'Banion's presentation in 2018 for Lockheed Martin was to show the world and the US government, the Pentagon, the black ops programs that have the funding to fund this, that they can actually make it happen now. So he's hinting, but basically hinting to the people that are of strategic importance at Skunk Works saying, hey, we can design this thing and we can do it for about a billion dollars a copy. Act today and we'll give you a buy one, get one free. So two for $1 billion. Any takers, Skunk Works is like me, me, me. So while the SR-72 may be flying under the radar for now, I believe it's just a matter of time before we see this thing or we see some variant of it. And in my opinion, look for a manned version and an unmanned version. Sorry, Maverick, you're gonna have some competition. There's gonna be an unmanned version up there which might be able to go a lot faster than you and it might be able to square corners a lot faster than you can. Keep in mind, the human body's got that nine to 10 G max, but an SR-72 that could essentially pull 30 40 50 100 g's imagine the capability of that so the sr72 remains to be seen we'll be on the lookout thanks for watching this video guys if you enjoyed it just watch another video that'll pop up over here that would be the best compliment that you can give me subscribe to the channel as well check out maxafterburner.co if you'd like to grab some threads and support the channel we'll see you on one of these videos over here most of all have a great day